Scientists have seen further back in time than ever before. The powerful Hubble telescope is giving astronomers a look at galaxies formed shortly after the dawn of time. But how does exploring outer space help us back here on Earth? Inside Story, out of this world. Hello, I'm Hazm Seeker. Welcome to the program. NASA scientists are getting very excited about their latest photo album. It's full of pictures of the universe when it was just a baby. Snapshots taken shortly after the so-called Big Bang, the event that triggered the first generation of stars. The experts say the discovery will allow us to learn more about how we came to be. It's fascinating, that's for sure. The universe is estimated to be some 13.7 billion years old. That's thousands of millions of years. The newly discovered galaxies are seen as they looked a few hundred million years after that. And here's the mind-boggling part. Their light is just arriving here on Earth now. It's taken that long to get to us. We'll have more on the science of all of this in just a moment, but let's take a moment to dwell on the more practical aspects of reaching out into space. It's 40 years ago this month since man was last on the moon. But what has been achieved since then? Now man is asking if there's life on Mars, and we've sent a rover to find out. But critics argue we should take a more down-to-earth approach, if you will, staying here on terra firma and sorting out the many problems a little closer to home. So is space exploration worth the cost? Well, here to discuss this and much more, we hope, are our guests in London, Francisco Diego. He's a senior research fellow in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at University College London. And he's vice president of the UK Association for Astronomy Education. In New Delhi, we have Kamal Chinoy. He's a professor of international studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University. He's also involved in social activism and was part of India's Right to Food campaign. And in New York, Max Ruskin. He's a journalist with the magazine Business Week. Welcome, all three of you gentlemen. Uh, Francisco Diego, if I could start with you. Um, how does this discovery uh, help us better understand the universe and its origins then? Uh, the formation of the very first stars that will fo eventually come into the very first galaxies has been a major mystery. All the time we didn't know exactly at what time they were forming. And uh, you know, uh, from the Big Bang, the only chemical elements that we get are hydrogen and helium. How can you form stars only with hydrogen and helium without, without having any heavy chemical elements to, uh, to modulate the amount of heat that goes in that process? It was still a mystery. We are discovering now galaxies which form only a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And that is a major, major discovery. One more of this uh, uh, now getting old uh, space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, which still gives us amazing discoveries as, uh, as he goes to the end of his, uh, of his uh, scientific lifetime. Kamal Chinoy, what does this discovery tell you, or does it tell you anything of any importance? Well, I think it's very important to know how the Earth was formed and what are the um, predictions about uh, how um, development, including environmental degradation, is having on the Earth. So I think that is very useful at, at, at a certain level. The question is how much is being spent on that and how much is being used for satellite imagery of the world and what is happening here. Max Ruskin, uh, what does this discovery uh, do in your view to enhance our understanding of the planets? Is, is this all a, a waste of time and money? And I suppose that question depends on whose money it is. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, that that's the question that we need to be asking. I mean, I love Carl Sagan as much as the next guy, but I think when we're running massive budget deficits, we need to be asking who should be spending this money to, um, to investigate the heavens. And I don't think it should be the federal government. I think that uh, we're seeing uh, massive innovation in the private sector to discover and to uh, go into space. And right now, with our financial situation in the United States, this is not something that the federal government should be doing. All right, well, we've been talking uh, about the Hubble telescope, which has discovered this. And while you uh, might not know exactly uh, what it is, you'll probably uh, recognize many of the beautiful pictures of stars, planets, or galaxies it has captured. 
Hubble is orbiting high above the Earth after being dropped off by the Space Shuttle Discovery in 1990. The telescope is named after the American astronomer Edwin Hubble. In all, NASA has four powerful space-based telescopes. And it's thanks in part to Hubble that NASA has been able to work out the age of the universe, as we mentioned, some 13.7 billion years old. The telescope has also helped NASA scientists determine how planets are born. So knowing all that, then just turning back to you, uh, Francisco Diego, where, where does this particular discovery uh, rank then in, in the general scheme of things? Is it a, a, a game changer, do you think? It is a very important discovery, the fact that uh, we are looking at the stars that were formed only a few million years after the, uh, the Big Bang. And it is, uh, it is uh, one of the major mysteries that we have. We know how the stars form, uh, live and die in more recent times, like the sun, like the stars we see in the sky. But these are uh, recent stars. The original stars that came after the Big Bang were a mystery because they were formed with only hydrogen and helium because was, those were the only chemical elements present at the time. And the Space Telescope is now giving us an insight on how this may have happened. Kamal Chinoy, as a, as a, a social activist, what point does this serve for you? I mean, uh, can we justify the expense of all of this when, when there are so many people on this planet who are going hungry? Well, you know, I don't think science should be restricted, but science should be adapted to the social economic condition of the time and the world is going through an economic crisis. So we will have to prioritize what scientific experiments we take forward and others we keep uh, until a better time for the world economically. Max Raskin, I mean, I mean you talked earlier about the, 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 the cost of all of this and who's paying for it, but space exploration by nature is expensive and uh, its benefits in a lot of ways aren't immediately obvious. Does that make it an easy target, do you think? Well, no, I, I mean, I don't think that it's particularly expensive. NASA's budget, uh, for instance, in the upcoming year is going to be $18 billion, about $18 billion. That's, that's, that's like what the Pentagon spends on postage stamps. Um, it's, it's an easy target to go after because uh, what it represents is the, the federal government dictating what research needs to be, be done instead of entrepreneurs, instead of innovators, instead of scientists. So I think what we need to ask ourselves is, is, is the question, should, if something should be done, who should do it? Uh, and just because something's good doesn't mean it has to be subsidized, uh, you know, by, by federal expenditures. Francisco Diego, as a, as a man who, who advocates uh, space exploration, I want to put this point to you because many people will say we've got too many serious problems uh, on this planet uh, right now which need our full attention and financial uh, commitment, I have to emphasize. How do you justify the amounts of money uh, that might be spent on this? We have to, I think, keep all this into perspective. We have to think about the different ways in which humankind spends money. And uh, uh, if we are going to criticize different aspects of our society that are spending money in, uh, in uh, such and such a way, we have to keep things into context, keep things in, into proper scale. The amount of money that is uh, being uh, uh, invested in uh, space exploration, in the discovery of nature in the grandest of the, of the ways possible, it's as we just heard, is nothing compared with the uh, other money spent in other, other things which are far more destructive and far more damaging to the environment and to the human life. So we have to keep this into perspective. And the amount of money that goes into the Space Telescope, into the Large Hadron Collider, into all these uh, major experiments, yes, it is millions of dollars, but not trillions of dollars as we are seeing spent or in, uh, wasted in other, in other parts. So people criticizing these, these, uh, uh, way, these investments should go for the big targets first because that's where the big money is. What we are talking here is something that is costing much less and in giving enormous benefits. And uh, we could go on list a, a very long list of benefits that we get from space exploration, direct and indirect, uh, uh, from the knowledge of the universe, from the technology involved, from the high, high tech involved in, this, in these discoveries. 
the mm -hmm. benefits are enormous. I want to ask you a little bit more about some of those uh, benefits in just a moment, but let's just take a, a step back for a moment now because it's been a busy uh, time up there for a while now. Things started to take off in 1957 when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the world's first satellite. It marked the beginning of years of space exploration and a fierce rivalry with the United States. The USSR scored another victory in 1961 when Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. But the U.S. took a giant leap for mankind when Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon on July 20th, 1969. The moon program ended three years later and no one has been back since. Instead, the U.S. turned its attention to Mars, landing the orbiter Viking on the red planet in 1975. The U.S. launched its first space shuttle in 1981, a program that was to last until July of last year. Now, the International Space Station started to take shape in 1998, now a joint project between five international space agencies. Spaceship One completed the first manned private space flight in 2004, and the first official commercial flight to the International Space Station lifted off in October of last year, carrying an unmanned cargo capsule. Now, uh, Max Ruskin, is that uh, the, the future of space travel, do you, need, do you believe, in, in the private sector rather than the public sector? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just me who's saying this. You have NASA administrators who are saying that uh, what we need to be shifting towards is a private run model where just as FedEx delivers the post office, uh, FedEx delivers the mail and UPS delivers the mail, mail is a good thing in the same way that space exploration is a good thing. But who, who should be doing it? And I think you mentioned the, the, uh, the capsule being sent up to the International Space Station. That was done by private uh, entrepreneurs, uh, Elon Musk and, at SpaceX. And I think that's just much more exciting. They're able to do it uh, at a lower cost because they have the rightly aligned incentive structure. When you have governments, when, whenever the government gets involved, you have all sorts of lobbying going on. And it, it's less about how effective you're able to uh, spend the money and how, how much favor you're able to curry. And I think that that's, uh, I think that's the model. And with NASA phasing out the shuttle program, that's what that's what it's going towards. But and isn't gonna, uh, isn't see, uh, I mean, Max um, Raskin? Isn't space exploration about uh, taking risks, uh, making making mistakes? Sometimes it's it's a trial and error process, and 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 learning from that whole process. Isn't um, the public sector the better arena uh, to be doing that? Where where there is uh, a, uh, there is the opportunity uh, to fail and and to and to try again. Whereas in the in in the private sector, there are commercial pressures that perhaps don't allow for that. I mean, is that something that people should be concerned about? Well, listen, I don't know if you ever met a bureaucrat, but they tend not to be the most innovative entrepreneurial thinkers. I mean, you talk about risk. When government takes a risk, it, it has an incentive to compound the risk if they make mistakes. No one ever gets fired in the government, right? No one ever resigns. Whereas in private industry, if someone makes a mistake, you have tons of competitors who are able to wean you and to show you the correct way to do things. So I think it's just much more innovative. I mean, who would you rather have, uh, I mean, take a look at the computer, uh, personal computer market, or take a look at uh, the mobile market. I mean, you, there's no way that it would be possible for the government to have done what Apple, Samsung, these companies have done. It's just uh, not possible because the, the those uh, commercial um, incentives that you say are damaging are actually what motivates people, right? People aren't necessarily motivated by um, uh, a, a desire to do good. They understand economics. Francisco Diego, what's your view on this? I mean, as we see more uh, money for space exploration coming from the private sector, how does that uh, change the dynamic uh, of space travel for you? Uh, yes, uh, well, I, 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 I partially agree with Max, but I uh, disagree in, in some aspects because uh, to produce a mobile phone or to produce a, a, a gadget is going to be sold by the millions. The main, the main uh, motivation here is money. And in, when you're talking about science, scientific exploration, when you're talking about space exploration, it's not you're not, do, you're not doing that for money, you're not doing that for profit, you're in do, doing that just for the sake of knowing what is there, and eventually to take humankind out of this planet, which is going to end at some point in the far distant future. Now, NASA has always have 
private industry building the rockets and building, I mean, the Saturn V rocket was built by private companies and it was launched by NASA, but always with these, uh, with these uh, guidelines from NASA. So the private companies have been always involved in the space exploration in the case of the United States and in the case of Europe as well, because private companies are building the Ariane rocket and all the other uh, uh, rockets and, and uh, spacecraft that are, are launched from, from Europe. So uh, uh, the, other, the other important thing is that uh, uh, we are now going into an era where the, uh, uh, the space becomes wider. I mean, this vision of just, yes, we have been to the moon, but now we want to go to Mars. We want to go beyond. And Mars is becoming the main target because Mars has the major incentive of being the unenvir an environment where life may be present now, and certainly, in my opinion, was present millions of years ago. And that's a very important thing to know. And this is one, one of the most important things about, about space exploration. Kamal Chinoy, when we talk about private versus public uh, money being spent on, on, on space exploration, is, is this going to be, in your view, more about making money than, than expanding our knowledge? No, I think uh, our space program, number one, is wholly public sector funded. The private sector is really not interested. And um, space exploration has uh, been uh, done together with using nuclear energy and a whole host of scientific uh, developments which have been funded by the public sector. The only thing to remember, of course, is that in India, 77% of the population live on less than 50 cents a day. So the, there is a problem of uh, a resource constraint and that is why uh, the private sector is not interested, doesn't think it will be profitable. And the entire burden for space exploration and other work is uh, uh, put on the public sector. Max Raskin, if I could turn back to you on this issue of, of, of uh, the private sector getting more involved in, in uh, space exploration. I mean, a lot of people are worried that uh, as that happens more and more, their involvement will somehow, uh, and I, I think this point has been raised a little bit in this discussion there, their virtues of, of, of uh, pure science will, will, will somehow be sullied by uh, the need to make money because they, these are uh, private endeavors uh, at the end of the day. And it may lead to, uh, in some cases, perhaps uh, a scenario where there are unrestrained uh, land grabs and this basically becomes a battle uh, for resources and nothing else. Listen, I mean, exploration and innovation have always been tied very closely to profit. I mean, Columbus came here searching for, for a spice route to, to make profit, the Dutch East India Company. I mean, New York, New York City was founded on the principles of commerce and commerce and tuck and barter. And, you know, if you look at Steve Jobs, if you look at Bill Gates, these guys may have began, uh, you know, in their, in their garages noodling around because they thought it was interesting, but eventually they saw that the way to progress in any field is to monetize it and not just uh, to greedily search for more profits, but because the, the, the capitalist system is able to uh, create incentives so that capital, so that resources are used in productive ways. And productive doesn't just mean money producing. Productive means in a way that is going to uh, redound to the b better good of humanity, right? I mean, we like food. Food costs money. We like lots of things, and these things cost money. Just because something costs money or has been monetized doesn't mean it, it uh, is somehow uh, lessened or cheapened. Francisco Diego, what's your view on that? I saw you nodding to some of that. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I, I, I agree with that, with Max. But uh, I was uh, going to mention a, a very important example of uh, exploration in our planet, which is the Antarctica continent. In Antarctica, we have a multinational scientific community which is exploring the continent for the sake of, of, of science, for extent of scientific research, with no uh, uh, motivation of, of making any profit. There are lots of resources. There's probably there is oil, there will be uh, I don't know, a lot of resources that uh, are, are waiting there to be, to be exploited. And I don't know if we will ever, should or should not be, be doing that. Space exploration, in my view, in the view of many of my colleagues, should be done internationally. Not a single nation, but as an international community going into space and sharing that enormous uh, uh, wealth of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge, of uh, resources that we have there, but as an international community. All right, I just want to turn uh, briefly back to Max Raskin because I just saw him uh, shaking his head there to some of that. 
Well, I mean, I, I don't think it should necessarily be done internationally. I think you should try to localize and make it as individually, individual as possible. I don't want the UN, for instance, sending rockets up. I'd like to see private individuals acro across borders uh, uh, getting involved in these things and having the government stay as far away as possible. Kamal Chinoy, um, as, as you look at some of these discoveries uh, in, in the world of, of, of space exploration and, and, and space travel, do you worry that uh, in the future there will be too much of a focus on this at the expense of some of the bigger problems that, that we have here on Earth? No, I don't, but I worry very much about um, too much of a role being given to the private sector whose motive is profit as opposed to public sector scientists like you have on the program who are basically interested in the development of science. So an internationalization of space research is a very good idea. It would also mean international scrutiny of expenditure and achievements. And that is essential given the colossal amount of money which is being used over looking at the long-term future of the planet and of the people on it. Francisco Diego, um, you had talked earlier about some of the benefits that, are, that have come from, from space exploration and space travel o over, the, over the last few years. What do you think this particular discovery that we talked about uh, at the top of the show um, by the Hubble telescope, what do you think that will do in terms of uh, enhancing not, not just our, our knowledge of the planets, but just giving us tangible be benefits in the near future? Well, it is, uh, it is very difficult to tell. I mean, the connections come much later. The fact that we discover stars which are only uh, a few hundred million years from the Big Bang, uh, it is uh, a major discovery. We know about how uh, stars form. We may know a little bit more about nuclear fusion, which is one of the major uh, targets of modern technology to achieve this controlled nuclear fusion. Perhaps we will know a little bit about that, that will be important, will have enormous benefits to humankind. Who knows? It's very difficult to tell at these very early stages. And, uh, but uh, I must emphasize, this is not the reason that this research is being done, because we are going to get some byproduct knowledge. It's, uh, the byproduct knowledge will come, or byproduct applications will come later on. Um, it's, um, I don't know, it is, uh, 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 risky and difficult and, and dangerous and, and almost impossible to, to link an important scientific discovery to, to immediate applications. I remember Michael Faraday when uh, he was asked the same question. He was dealing with uh, electromagnetic induction and converting electricity into magnetism and working into what will be electric uh, generators and electric motors eventually. And at the time, people asked him, what, Mr. Faraday, what is all this use, what is use? Uh, what is the use for this? What, how are we going to, to, to make use for this? What is the benefit for humankind of all this electric uh, magnetism that you are doing? And he said, what is the use of a newborn baby? You see, that is the, the, the capsule that, that goes into scientific research. What is the use of this newborn baby that will grow and will be something amazing, but we don't know what it's going to be? Yeah, let me let me put that point then to uh, Max Raskin in New York. I mean, curiosity is 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 what drives us uh, um, as a species, if I could put it that way. But is that same sort of noble goal so apparent in the in the private sector, when for for many of these enterprises, uh, it is essentially about making money. Listen, I, I mean, I completely agree with what he what he just said. Man's capacity for wonderment is what distinguishes us. Uh, you know, the problem is when you when you let the wh the people who decide how money gets dispensed are not scientists. The people who decide how money gets dispensed are politicians. And I mean, do you really want to be tying who gets money to political concerns? I think what should drive who gets money to do research is who's able to uh, who's able to convince people that this is interesting. I mean, we have a thriving nonprofit sector. Look at education in this country is, is uh, a nonprofit industry. And, you know, the major research institutions, uh, they, don't they don't need government aid to exist. So I think that it's a, a false dichotomy that you're, sh that you're creating between a profit sector uh, where people are greedy and penurious and this, uh, you know, idealistic government sector where everyone is an angel and uh, they're motivated by the most... Uh, they're motivated by the most noble of, of ambitions, but that's not how it is. In fact, it, it is often not the case. No, a valid point, mm -hmm. uh, but on that we're going to have to uh, leave it there. Thank you to uh, all three 
of our guests in London, Francisco Diego, Kamal Janoy from New Delhi, and Max Raskin in New York. Thanks very much for your time. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Remember, you can see this program again and watch many others by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. I'm Hazem Seeker. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.